All right, let's share the screen and I'll pull up. All right. So um, Jen and I are um, doing this presentation with Dr. Ruth Moore and um, she is um, currently the president of the Association for Creativity and Counseling, if I have that correct. And so um, Jen and I have been working with Dr. Moore for the last couple of months, um, uh, just within the Association of Creativity and Counseling, and we presented in the, um, in the conference this past okay. December, and Dr. Moore has been um, a great facilitator in trying to get um, the work that we've been doing. Nachos put into a journal article. And so um, with this um, thinking outside the box, creativity and counseling, um, we're just gonna give you some background information and um, hopefully that you guys get as much out of this as we did. So I will uh, let- Here, Jennifer. I'll let Dr. Moore introduce herself. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all- I, I need everyone to go on mute, by the way. Thank you. Uh, yes, first of all, I just want to thank you all for being here today, and we've got a lot of information to give you, so um, welcome, and uh, I can't say enough wonderful things about Jennifer and Jordan and the work that they've been doing um, with ACC, so, and we'll talk more a little bit about that, but um, I am a full-time faculty here at the Chicago School of Psychology Online. Um, I have been a clinical mental health counselor for over five years, and my area of specialty is counseling. Particularly those it it trauma, uh, and I do a lot of work with play therapy, counseling techniques, yeah. high conflict. Yeah, and uh, someone mute their the next slide if you can. Um, so we're just going to talk a little bit. The learning objectives will be what we're going to focus on is um, giving you some creative counseling techniques that you can use to establish rapport with clients, some benefits of creative techniques in counseling in general, and some ethical codes to consider before implementing those strategies in counseling sessions. Next slide. Okay. So what is creative counseling? So when you think about creativity and counseling, especially if you're new to the field of creative counseling, you might think, oh, that's, that's art, you know, that's music, um, which are certainly components of it, but it goes so far beyond that. Creative counseling does encompass music, literature, theater, drama, art, dance, animal-assisted therapy, complementary and alternative therapies, play therapy, and yoga and mindfulness. So a, a lot of times we hear from people, I'm not a creative person, which we'll get into a little bit, but creative counseling doesn't mean you have to be a musician or you have to be a certified yoga instructor or a, a dancer. It just means that you are using your brain in a creative manner to work individually with clients and meet them at their level. So if you have a client who, um, you know, I work with kids right now and I have kids that love TikTok. Okay, so I'm thinking, how can I creatively use TikTok in the counseling environment? And believe it or not, we, we, really, we really have. So it's just being able to think, think on your feet and incorporate some of these things that let people express themselves and their emotions in unique ways. So I thought we'd take a moment to uh, look at a picture, and this is the experiential part, or one of them. Um, so when you look at this picture, what do you see? And you can type it in the chat if you'd like. Lots of chaos, lots of creativity, happy kids, chaos. Normal say kids having fun, tired mom. Mom giving up. Yeah, frazzled mom, pretty doggy. Overwhelmed, absent dad. Danger of kid falling, kid on the counter. There's a kid in the microwave, if someone didn't notice that. I didn't the first time. There's a kid with his head in the microwave, so. <laughs> yeah, I like the one who said Monday in a picture. <laughs> Black so this is like every mom right now who's homeschooling all of a sudden. 
disorderly home. Quarantine. <laughs> That's so true. Um, what's happening now? You, and so um, a mess, yes. And you know, it's interesting every time I see this photo, I see something different. And uh, Jen and Jordan and I were talking about that yesterday, like the kid in the microwave or, you know, the girl in the, on the corner, in the corner. Um, and mom looks pretty checked out. You know, when I've showed this picture before at presentations, I've had people say, I wonder what's in our, our coffee cup, it, you know, and suspecting that she looks like she would be drinking or hungover <laughs> or something like that. Um, so what if I were to say to you that she is your college professor, right? Or maybe she is your, um, your child's school teacher, or maybe she is the um, CEO of the largest bank in America. Would that be surprising? Definitely puts it into a different perspective. I yeah. Think Someone said brings to life that no one really knows anyone else's story. And that's an excellent point. And that's kind of the point of this picture. And as we're talking about creative counseling techniques, is that a client, this, this woman who looks like this, may actually come into a counseling session and present very well. She may be in her business suit with her high heels and her makeup's on and her hair's on point. Um, and she may come in and say, I'm just feeling a little overwhelmed at home during this quarantine, but we might not get this picture, um, you know, or sometimes I probably don't set enough boundaries with my children, but we don't necessarily get the extent of what that is. Um, so we're gonna talk about the importance of creative counseling techniques to help you kind of get the session to a deeper level so that you can gain a greater sense of awareness of what's really going on with your client or what's really going on with the families with whom you work. So, next slide. Um, so there are barriers in the counseling relationship um, that occur. Certainly we have clients that can be court ordered that may be resistant to therapy. Adolescents a lot of times are typical are you know resistant. Um, in couples counseling, sometimes you have one person that wants to be there and someone else that doesn't. Um, also, I've had a lot of, of clients who were mandated by their employer um, as part of a disciplinary um, uh, consequence. You know, I had one that was had anger management issues and, and broke the coffee machine because he got frustrated with it and ripped off part of the back of it. Um, and so they were like, yeah, you get some help with this or, you know, you're, you're terminated. So those clients might be way more resistant than others. And certainly there's mistrust in the counseling relationship. It's, it's, think about that. You're going to talk to somebody that you don't know about your deepest, you know, most sensitive issues. So there can be mistrust there and kind of a sense of awkwardness and anxiety. And then certainly stigma that there's, you know, a lot of people still feel that it's, um, you know, that there's a negative, negative stigma um, in terms of getting mental health services. So we're going to talk about how creative counseling techniques um, can be helpful in, you know, pushing through those barriers along the way. So the presenting issues that we have, um, obviously within this particular, um, you know, creativity and counseling and what we can be, uh, you know, faced with is, you know, suicidal ideation is a problem and the non-suicidal self-injury, depression, anxiety, abuse and trauma, attention deficit disorder and disruptive behavior. Um, and so like Dr. Moore was saying before, which I'll touch on in the next slide is um, a lot of um, the therapy uh, a lot of the individuals going into therapy are either court ordered or um, mandated by a particular um, employer. And so um, for myself, um, my parents got divorced when I was younger, I think by like six or seven is when um, that happened. And so um, I was court mandated to go into particular um, therapy with a divorce counselor. And, um, and so that was due to in part of me acting out um, getting in fights on the playground and not paying attention in school. And so um, because my teachers were pretty hyper aware of the situation, they, you know, relayed that information to my parents. And then obviously that mandate went into effect. So obviously the depression and anxiety that go into that as well um, for myself with the, you know, with my parents not being together anymore. So that was definitely an issue when going into um, therapy itself. And then obviously 
um, the family issues like I was touching on, you know, abuse and violence, substance use, divorce, high conflict, and, um, you know, an absent parent or abandonment, um, mental health issues, even among parents and or siblings. So I know for myself, you know, during the divorce with my parents, um, my mom was a recovering alcoholic. And so um, she was also getting help for her mental health issues as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, obviously those particular issues are huge factors when um, when these clients are coming into you for help though I mean there's so many there's it's like that big iceberg that we've all seen in our psychology courses we may only see you know what's on the surface but then when we look underneath we have you know um, you know a mom that died or addiction within the family so that's something that we all have to think about when um, dealing with these types of clients is that you know we may only see one thing but then once we get into it you know like that picture you know that may be the huge CEO of a bank but at home she's dealing with a lot so well and I was just going to add to that as well um, that we also have to remember that sometimes the like a child can be the identified client um, so you know like the example you gave Jordan with yourself it's like Jordan might have been the identified client but there certainly was a lot more going on in the family that might not have been initially disclosed um, and so it's a nice segue into looking at some of the benefits of creative approaches. First of all, it's a great way to establish rapport. I mean, think about it. What think about what it would be like, um, you know, to you know, walk in and tell a stranger, you know, you know, about your first sexual experience. I mean, if I said right now we're going to all share our first sexual experience with one another, um, you know, probably a lot of you would drop off the call. Um, but if that would be something very difficult to share with another person, yet we expect clients to come in and share some of the deep, deepest, most sensitive moments. It was certainly a good way to establish rapport, to allow clients to see that, you know, counseling isn't just laying on a couch and staring at the ceiling like, you know, what everyone sometimes thinks about um, going to see my quote unquote shrink. Um, it's a way to empower clients. It's a way to help facilitate disclosure um, that they can, they can, share what they want to share, not necessarily have to own the problem, um, but it also, because it encourages that self-expression. It can work through anger, hostility, shame, <clears throat> help them gain insight that they might not normally get. Um, it can help foster resilience that we can certainly see clients bounce back sometimes and have that aha moment that they might not have otherwise had if had we not, in, you know, used a prop or, you know, done some type of, of self-expression activity. Um, and it can help determine the underlying emotional needs. Next slide. Um, so we'll talk more about this uh, slide later. I probably should have moved that one. Um, uh, when we talk about ethical considerations. Um, so we can skip over that one and we'll talk about that later. Um, so we're going to uh, do an activity that's, um, you can advance to the next, uh, next slide. Okay, um, so we have a heart on the page. And what I would like you to do is just grab a piece of paper and just draw a big heart on it. And I want you to just spend some time reflecting what's in your heart right now. So we'll take a few minutes for that. Okay, does anyone want to share what's 
in their heart, you can un we can unmute you or you can type in the chat if you want to share anything that's in your heart right now. Or you can go on video and show us what's in your heart. Mm -hmm. oh, that's good. Lisa put my daughter, family, spring flowers. I'll just read the things in the chat. Family, lack of communication with our children, hope, family, concerns, sunshine, self worry. So it's interesting just me reading through these that there's, you know, a lot of objectively positive things, you know, family, love, spring flowers, and then I see where it's like worry. Yeah, I definitely you have know. some anxiety and some, you know, fear of the unknown in my heart right now, definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, and I actually, for some reason, had a heart on my uh, kitchen, I mean, on my dining table, and it was, I, I think Wesley made it in school, I don't know where it came from, or why it's on the dining table, but it's like, where's my son? But so I was like, oh, well, there's a heart right there. Um, and I had some of the same things, fear, love, confusion, stress, but a lot of gratitude. And certainly, um, you know, that's something for us to remember, especially right now, as we're working with our clients, our clients are coming in with whatever their pre original presenting issue was, but now we've added another trauma, layer of trauma on top of it. And, you know, I, it reminds me of when I was seeing clients during 9-11, um, that, you know, I already had clients who were coming in that were depressed, I already had clients who were coming in with challenges. And so now, you know, this is a, another added. Dr. Moore has her son in her heart, <laughs> and you can tell that he's her heart. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Did anyone else want to share their, uh, yeah, this is the challenge of, uh, yeah, being at home. Uh, does anyone else have anything they want to share that's in their heart? Okay, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, I've used this activity before, I use it a lot with my groups at a, um, at a school where I was working, and one of the things that I found, it's like, okay, you know, I bring in just these little, I had these little doily hearts that I brought in, um, and that it was interesting that just having that prop, prop there, that if I said, you know, to them, hey, what's in your heart today? I probably wouldn't have gotten very much, but when we just took some time to reflect, and I had one child or one she, an adolescent, she was an uh, eighth grader, um, but she had lost her mother to pancreatic cancer unexpectedly several years prior, and um, the father had a really hard time, and you know the, the girls got lice, and he didn't know how to treat it, and and then the father ended up marrying actually the school counselor that was there before me, so that but the you know the she had a hard time dealing with the fact that dad moved on pretty quickly and got married to someone else and it was a blended family. Um, but she had become very promiscuous and um, was sexting a lot of the kids at school and so everyone shared the information and so she was having a, a lot of um, issues with female peers, um, you know, calling her names and, you know, she's just developed a, a negative reputation. And so when she did her heart, on the front of the heart, she had things like loving, caring, kind. Um, and then on the back of the heart, she had all of these things like hate, it's unfair, sucks not having a mom, um, and all of these things. And so when she shared it, she said, this is my heart and the way everyone expects it to be. And this is the heart of where things really are for me. And it was really, really, um, you know, very, she gained a lot of insight just from that, that one activity. So. Um, and I'll add that this activity, you know, part of being creative is, is being able to adapt things, right? So I think this could be adapted in a group setting, you know, and having your group members share this with each other, adapted to family counseling, adapted to couples counseling. So if one partner wrote, wrote something in their heart, can you share that with the other partner and see how that aligns or doesn't align? Yeah, I agree. Um, the other thing that I will use in sessions is the stackable dolls. And if you um, have ever read any of Ed Jacobs' work, he's Ed Jacobs is a, a creative counselor and very active, in, uh, long time member of ACC. But um, so you've probably seen these little stackable dolls, nesting dolls is what they're called. 
but you can get them like they're animal animals they are the little uh, Russian looking dolls you can get them just as they are I found these on um, Amazon that these are actually made of chalkboard um, material and you can use chalk I also have some that are made out of dry erase and what I like about these is that you can um, this can be great for establishing rapport to just, you know, you can say, you know, tell me about yourself or tell me about your family or, um, or any of those things. And, um, and so a lot of times what you might get is you can see this one has a little family here, but that sometimes they might put, you know, dad as the little one because dad's never at home and mom's the big one because she makes all the rules. Um, or you might have the big one is my little brother because he is always causing trouble and the focus is always on him and I'm the little one in the family because nobody notices me. Um, next slide, Jordan. I just wanna show you what they look like here on the inside. So some, they, can, they can, sometimes they'll put words on them. But the other thing is, you know, when they nest, you can put, you can put the little one inside the big one. And so sometimes I'll use this with clients that might say, you know, there's a small part of me right now that wants to quit drinking, but there's a bigger part of me that says the hell with this and, and keeps drinking. So as the client, you know, you're reflecting that back. So it sounds like, you know, there's this small part and that when you get up every day and say, I'm not going to drink today, the bigger part says, and that negativity takes over. And then I'll put the little one inside the big one, you know, or I'll, I might say, you know, tell me um, which you know, how, how big is the part of you that wants to leave this abusive relationship? Or how big is the part of you that wants to, um, you know, really work towards this promotion? So you can kind of use that with size and, you know, so what do we need to do to make this little voice stronger so that it doesn't keep getting drowned out by the big voice? And to add to that, Dr. Moore, I think it's a really good way to be able to give clients not only the fact that you're helping them bring out what's inside of them, but it's like a visual representation of, you know, the, the back and forth within them, like, okay, the drinking problem is a big deal, but then, you know, it, it's also beneficial for my health if I stop and, you know, it, you know, it helps, you know, life down the road. So I think it gives the client a really good um, visual representation of, you know, what exactly is in front of them and how they're able to um, tackle these particular conflicts they're having within themselves. And I know, like, if I was a client, I would appreciate these types of creative, you know, outlooks on um, trying to, you know, heal and to get through whatever issues that they're presenting with. So I think it's a really, um, it's a really good idea um, and able to um, bring them out of their shell, I think, too, able to promote some type of communication as well. And, and speaking of communication, these creative techniques are so great for individuals who have limited verbal skills, right? So if you want them to answer, tell me about your family, tell me about your emotions, and they maybe literally cannot. Using some kind of creative technique, whether it's nesting dolls, drawing, dancing, whatever it might be, you'd be amazed at the information you can gain from that. Right, and I think that's the other, um, you know, like what I think about the, because a lot of times people think creative approaches with children. Um, they think play therapy with children, you know, but there, there's a lot of um, research out there with play therapy being done with, or sand tray therapy being done with, um, you know, with veterans, you know, um, and so I think, as we talk about thinking outside of the box, that's what we're thinking of. And I just remember, you know, with a lot of my clients, adult clients where I've used these, it really, they really had an aha moment because they would reference this. Several sessions down the road, they said, you know, um, this weekend I went home and, I, you know, I started to just, you know, not turn my computer on. But then I thought about what we talked about several weeks ago, that there's that little voice that says, I want this promotion. And the bigger voice that says, what's the point you're not going to get it and it's like no wait a second what do I need to do to just make that voice a little bit stronger so I turned on my computer and I actually reviewed some documents and I started putting my portfolio together so it, it really it really can facilitate that aha moment that maybe they wouldn't have had otherwise you know that it's um I remember one one client that I had worked with and she had a long long history of severe sexual and physical abuse and she never told anyone because she was dealing with it as an adult, but she was so caught up in self-blame and that, you know, that this is my fault, this is all my fault. I didn't tell. If I told, maybe someone would have protected me. And it was almost like a goodwill hunting, you know, it's not your fault, it's not your fault, it's not your fault. And I must have said it, 
I can't even tell you how many times I've said it over the had said it over the course of the sessions, and we did, um, you know, we did this activity. I, you know, use these props with her, and because she did know, like she would say, I, I know it's not my fault, but at the same time, I still can't feel like it's my fault. And so I talked about that with her. I was like, so there's this little voice deep down inside that you know that this that this is not your fault, yet this bigger voice is saying it is your fault. And it, you know, keeps sucking, you know, sucking up the little voice. And it was the next session she came in and she's like, you know, I thought about what you said in our last session. And I was like, okay. And I'm thinking, what did I say? And she said, no, when we did the, when we used the prop. And I said, yes. And she goes, I left here and thought, oh my gosh, it's not my fault. And she said, and I just went home and I cried. And she said, but it was, it was tears of, it was tears of grief, but also tears of joy in knowing she is for the first time. She goes, you've said it every week, every week you've said, this is not your fault. And she goes, but I don't know why for the first time I've heard that. Um, so, you know, just the power of what can actually happen in the session. Um, another activity that I use is, um, it, I call it tools in a toolbox. So, Oriental trading is like my, my best friend. Um, and I, I seriously, a lot of times go through Oriental trading catalogs and just say, how can I use this with, um, you know, how can I use this with clients? How can I use this? Um, so I found these little kits. They actually had some that were, where you could, that were bigger, but this was a little kit that I found. And it had lots of tools because a lot of times I talk with, with you know, a client about, you know, what, what tools do you have in a toolbox? You can't use a hammer if you're trying to drill a hole. Um, you know, so may, let's say it's a parent that's saying, you know, I, I can't get my teenager to listen to me. And it's like, well, you know, what do you do? Or, well, I've, you know, I've sprained, I've threatened. And it's like, okay, well, you're kind of using a hammer um, to try to drill a hole here. So let's look at the tools you have in your toolbox. Or maybe it's a client that struggles with addiction that says, you know, you know, I know I should work out or I know I should do this, but you know, at the end of a stressful day, I just say, mm, I want to drink. And so we might look at what tools. So drinking is a tool you have in your toolbox. You know, drinking is your coping mechanism, your stress mechanism. What are some other coping skills that maybe you'd like to develop? And this one was actually done by, um, it was actually done by a father um, and he had anger management issues. And it was basically where the wife had said, you know, you go to counseling or get out because he had become bordering on verbally abusive. He would get physical, but it jumped to physical discipline when other um, types of discipline would have been more appropriate. And so he um, initially yelling, screaming, punching things. I mean, everything was aggressive. Those were the only tools he had in his toolbox. Um, so over time, we began to look at how his toolbox was changing. And so what he said was he recognized that, I like the fact that he did yell as a, as, a, as a saw. He said, I still yell, but I recognize that, that that's, not, that's not the best way to, to handle things. And he's like, so I try to jog, I try to get some alone time to de-stress, and I try to find a different way to express it. So that was, um, you know, his way of, of, and then they can kind of take it with them. It's symbolic, you know, and, and I was surprised at first that, you know, especially in working with not just stereotype, but sometimes, you know, you get these, you know, males that come in that are really, and females too, you know, that are really strong and they don't want to, um, but you'd be surprised that they like want to take it with them because it's they're like a reminder or, you know, something that is, when I look at this, I'm going to remember, you know, yelling at the saw and, you know, I can't, you know, screw a screw in with a saw. Next slide. All right. Okay, so I think this is my creative divergent thinking slide. And I saw, I think Dr. Brown's here. And yeah, I think, too. and I think Anastasia is here. I think I saw her. So they will get this and they're not allowed to cheat. Um, so one creative activity you could do with clients is to grab an object in the room and have them think of as many uses as they can for that object. Um, I have done this with children, but it can be used for people really of all ages to get them out of 
one mindset. So particularly for clients who might be stuck, uh, for clients who have black and white thinking patterns to help them practice divergent thinking. Divergent thinking, you know, obviously being, uh, you know, the ability to explore multiple solutions to generate creative ideas. Um, so you can use anything you find in your room. I, for you guys, am going to use something that was given in our goodie bags at last year's Association for Humanistic Counseling Conference. And we struggled for a very long time to figure out what the heck this was and what it was used for. So I know it's hard to see on here, but I'm just gonna do a little show, put in the chat box or jump in and say what you think this possibly could be used for. Looks Someone like music. A clacker or something that you, I don't know, that's what Songs. Not the songs you wear. <laughs> tongs, <laughs> a hoop and cup game, cooking, measuring spoon. I had almost all of these ideas. Does it have um, a, like an indention on both sides? Yeah. Okay. What did you say, Doctor Moore? It's, it's got an indent, like a a groove on both sides, kind of like a spoon on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so I don't know. I think it was me and 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 Anastasia. Like, what in the world is this thing? Um, I thought, I thought maybe a shoehorn. I thought maybe like, it looks like a perfect size to put one of those little votive candles in. Okay. So it's, <laughs> so there's a lot of creative thinking in the comment box, but you ready for the answer guys? Okay. That's not going to work, but, oh, so it is a musical instrument and I think it must, might just be old and rusty, but oh, like this. Yeah. That's like a drum. Oh, applaud yourself if you guessed music. I would have thought also, <laughs> I would think that you could put a ball on one side and then try to flip it and press the ball on the other side. I mean, but you could use it for anything. I might put a little bit of candle in it and just, <laughs> but it's, you know, so you might not have this particular item in <laughs> your toolbox, um, but it can be great just to, so if you have a client, say, who, their, on their treatment plan goal is expanding their ability to think outside the box, to um, get get unstuck, so to say, and you're struggling with how can I get them out of this place? How many uses can you think of for a pen? You know, just get them, get them rolling with that. And I think it's a really good way to be able to facilitate that communication that's so necessary because a lot of the times these clients come in, whether it's forced or mandated, and um, they may not necessarily have anything to say because they don't have that one thing that's going to trigger like, you know, conversation or like Dr. Moore was talking about how, you know, it was that one time that it finally just clicked. And so you never know what type of activity that that's going to do for your client. And I think um, these simple ones to be able to um, sort of facilitate imaginative, you know, creativity is one way of getting them to start that journey. So I think it's really fun. I want to make sure we touch on at some point, um, it's like 1233 now, because um, someone put in the chat, and this is just so applicable for right now, and it wasn't necessarily as applicable for when we started planning this conference, because our co virtual conference has always been virtual. I like to say virtual before it was cool, but someone put in the chat, telehealth, creative telehealth interventions, right? So a lot of us, if you're a counselor right now, you're either doing telehealth or you're probably not working. Um, so how, how are you doing that in a creative creative way. Um, you know, if anyone wants to jump in with suggestions about that, um, I will add some, some tools that I've been using with my clients. I've been seeing my clients through, through telehealth for a few weeks now. Um, using the screen share feature and finding appropriate videos on YouTube. Um, so I have a five-year-old student um, and we found, a, you know, cute, catchy emotion songs on YouTube showed them and just watching him he was so attentive he was able to, to keep a, a five-year-old in a zoom call for 50 minutes um on zoom you can also um there's the whiteboard option so you can 
have people draw on the screen. You can play hangman. You can have them draw what's in their heart right there. Um, I was playing a, a Pictionary game with one of my clients. Um, uh, I also did a scavenger hunt. So since these clients are in their homes, I said, you know, can you find me something in your room that makes you happy? Okay, can you find me something in your room that reminds you of your grandma? Can you find something in your room that somebody made you? Something that calms you down when you're angry? Um, again, these are for kids, but you can adapt these if, if that was for um, an adult, they can still find something that calms them down when they're angry, right? We all need that and should have that in their room. Um, so any ideas that you guys have about telehealth, just jump in, put those in the uh, scavenger hunt through their cell phone photos. Yeah, a lot of things that we do face to face, you actually can do virtually. Mm -hmm. You know, you can even play, card, play cards, you know, show them what you have. Um, so it's really just about getting, getting ourselves on stuff. I think a lot of the issue with the virtual setting is that as counselors ourselves, we're stuck. We're used to our routine of going to the office and seeing them in person, and we feel like we can't do anything. I just want to um, mention some of the things, because there's some great things in the comments about um, creating new rituals has been crucial, having tea time, tea at the same time. Somebody mentioned go noodle mindfulness activities with kids. Um, uh, making an appointment to help decorate a cake because the kids had a birthday and were upset because they couldn't do anything. Um, some are joined by phone. Um, there's an Uno app. Yeah, lots of of um, lots of apps out there that are are good. A colleague of mine wrote an article called the iPad Playroom. Um, it was published in the Association for Play Therapy um, magazine years ago, but you could probably Google it or reach out and I can um, send me, email me and I can send you the reference. But it's, it's really good and talks about um, apps and how to use, you know, she was using it face to face, but I imagine you can you know, do, certainly do that virtually. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to say is in looking at, you know, uh, Jen made a great point, you know, you can ask clients to kind of help develop their creativity, but also as counselors, you know, I get, a, I hear a lot of people who say, oh, wait, I'm not, I'm not an ACC member, I'm not creative. I, I'm an ACEs member, I'm counselor ed and supervision. It's like, well, yeah, but you can be creative. You know, I'm, I'm research. And it's like, well, you can be creative even with research. It's, you know, or I'm humanistic. And it's like, well, you can be creative and humanistic. Um, so it isn't, an, you know, like you're creative or you're not. We all are creative people. We all are creative beings. We just have to tap into it and find a way to tap into it. And what might be my mode of creativity, like I may love music and using it in sessions with clients, and that might not be something that's comfortable for you, or someone else may re be really into psychodrama, and I think that, that feels strange to me. So, you know, that's the beauty of creativity, is just figuring out who you are as a creative, a creative entity, and especially during this time of where we're all, you know, self-quarantining, uh, or stay-at-home order, um, is to uh, find a creative outlet, because it, it it's easy to get stir crazy looking at the same um, four walls and all of that. So, and the other thing is, is to really think about like, you know, how can I use what I have? Or, you know, I like to walk the aisles of Target. I don't like Walmart, but I like to walk the toy aisles sometimes and look at the toys, not just, not for kids, and it's just for kids, but it's like, how could I use that? Um, you know, how could I use this in a session? I remember, um, I was at a, actually it was a fitness workshop, but she had bought something at Staples and it was a, it was a, just a little button that when you finished something, you could hit it and it would say, that was easy. And I thought, oh, well, that's great. You know, we could do that in counseling and that, you know, family counseling and uses it every time, you know, family members share. So that was easy. Um, you know, so it's really just kind of, like I said, going through oriental trading or, you know, um, looking at what you've got to say, how could I use this um, in a session? So, did, Jen, do we want to have them do that? You know, um, have everyone take a moment to just look around your room and find an object. It could be any object. Um, and think of how you might use it in a counseling session. And feel free to share, because that's how we grow, right, from learning about each other's ideas. I 
had to get mine. Um, I know that earlier someone put in that they're doing phone counseling and saying how that's it's harder to be creative. Um, agree. One thing that I used, and again, everything specific to the client, but I was working with a client um, with social skills difficulties. So we role played a phone job interview um, because that was something we could do on the phone and that would put him right in the situation, right? So he would be on the phone. So we role played me asking him questions that he would be doing a job. So maybe you could think of something that would be um, applicable. A lot of people have anxiety about being on the phone. So maybe it could be um, like a psychodrama of talking to their mom on the phone or um, so there's some great things in the chat, crossword puzzles, on words that you can come up with, um, a ruler, a hole punch. Um, tell us what you'll do with that, Candy. My, uh, my dog, I'm wanting him to be certified therapy dog. Oh, awesome. Um, candle could demonstrate how strong emotions make it difficult for others to connect and touch us. Ooh, I like that. Also, you could blow it out and set practice deep breathing. That's what um, I do. I use a pinwheel for that, too, with kids or with adults as well. A water bottle, maybe you could fill it up with emotions. Yes, love that. Y'all are awesome, look at you. Stuffed monster, perhaps the client could come up with a background story and what their next adventure would be. Soft rubber heart that is squeezable, and sometimes it's comforting to hold it and squeeze. Um, oh, so you've got a, someone's got a playroom. I have access to a lot of toys that can be used in a lot of ways. A broom, take the broom, and what are the things you want to sweep under the rug? Oh, I love that. Oh, that's a good one. You guys are good. <laughs> oh, I love Holly's battery example, too. I just love that. Something to do with light and warmth, yes. Teacups are my favorite to take for clients, mom, single parent, and we usually fill up the teacup and empty it and ask what fills your cup back up. Oh, yeah. Like that. Um, the entire Paw Patrol crew, so maybe the pups can solve some problems. Oh, I love the Paw Patrol. I work with a lot of kids, so Paw Patrol is popular. Cooking pot with a lid, maybe trying to decide what would be discovered if the pot was their heart and um, what was removed. Off of coffee machine, and like many, I don't drink it for the caffeine. It's a ritual about calming enjoyment. Uh, Northwestern Student Program. Um, Brad assisted to Dr. Costello. She's doing research on creative mindfulness. I'm just starting to research. Awesome. Um, outside near my kid's sandbox would be great. I really like aspects of sand tray. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Sand tray is great. Um, ruler hole punch to describe a scale of some sort. Describe an experience with the holes where you would like to take, take out. Oh, that's awesome. Um, some batteries. Maybe could, um, what happens when our batteries are not fully charged. Love that. Um, yeah, when we neglect ourselves and let our batteries die. Um, a jar of M&Ms, how you represent issues in their life and put M&Ms in cups when they can think of ways to handle their problems or see it differently. And I use M&Ms a lot because I talk about there's a hard chocolate shell, but on the inside is gooey chocolate. And that a lot of times clients come in and show us their hard shell, which might be anger. But beneath that is usually a softer emotion that people don't necessarily show, like you know, pain or, you know, hurt or sadness. And so a lot of times I'll say, you know, so it sounds like, you know, you're angry, but underneath that is the gooey chocolate that you don't want people to necessarily see. Um, that's awesome. Let's see, um, chat keeps scrolling me down. I was trying to make sure I got everyone. Um, um, Rachel, we can put our, right, so Rachel asked, how can we contact? to pick our brains more. I think we need to pick your brains more. <laughs> <Somebody> <laughs> yeah. brains chat. Um, but I'll put our, I'll put our emails in the chat. Also, every presentation is um, recorded and they're going to be up on the CMHC YouTube channel um, when we're, when we're done with the conference. Um, but let me, you know, I'll put my email in the chat and then if, if the other presenters want to put theirs in too. Hey, uh, Jim, while you're doing that, I'm just going to show you online. Yeah. I found this castle um, that was 
maybe. And um, so I would probably use this as like, maybe if a client was feeling depressed or overwhelmed, talking about feeling like you're at the end of the rope, where are you in terms of your rope at the end? You know, are you at the end of your rope yet? And maybe I would have them like, we would tie something on one end to be like, how to know before that you're getting too close to the end of the rope, like how to know that this is the, you know, where, where you want to be in the middle. So that would be how I use mine. Um, Holly asked in the chat, are there any creativity and counseling Facebook groups you would recommend? Um, Dr. Moore, I'm going to ask you that one. Association for Creativity and Counseling. You can go to our Facebook page. Um, you don't have to be a member to join the Facebook uh, group. Um, but there are all kinds of opportunities, uh, training opportunities and just a place to connect um, people doing research, sometimes people just wanting to know. Uh, the other thing is if you are an ACC member um, and, you know, a ACC is a division of American Counseling Association, there is a clearinghouse. Um, so one of the benefits of being a member is that you can access the clearinghouse. So you can literally type in anger management in you know, 50 activities may come up, of, you know, um, because people submit the activities with these, this is the supplies that you'll need, this is how you use it, um, and all of that. So um, ACC is one of the, you know, still acts, still sends a hard copy of the journal in the mail, which I, I like, um, and it's a, a great way to, I'm telling you the clearinghouse is worth it in, in and of itself. I'm going to put someone on the spot, but is Ashley Curtis here? I thought I saw her name in here. Uh, I am, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> so do you want to share your relation to the Association for Creativity and Counseling? Um, well, lately I've been <laughs> kind of doing my own thing because I'm also, I'm sure like everyone else, I'm at home trying to manage um, sessions via telehealth and then dealing with my kids. So I haven't been able to be that active um, as I want to be. But um, I did hold for a little while the um, emerging student master's level with the ACC. Um, what else were you asking for? I'm sorry. <laughs> you caught me off guard, well, Jen. <laughs> I just saw your name. Well, yeah. So, um, so can you say like what that designation was and maybe? So mostly um, when I was a master's level student, it gave me the opportunity to work closer with um, some of the board members and executives in the conference. Um, I Right now I'm on the board for the conference committee, which, you know, last year we weren't able to have it. And so I wasn't able to go because of the uh, hurricane hall and all of that. But um, that's pretty much, I mean, I've been trying to be more involved with it lately. It's just been kind of a, a mess with everything at going. I feel like everyone's kind of in my head. Yeah, we hear that. <laughs> Like, I'm trying to get my word together. I think that, um, you know, what we want you guys to just know is that there are, I mean, you know, let's say you have an interest in psychodrama. There, there are organizations out there that just focus on psychodrama. Um, ACC, one of the things that I, I like, though, is that we do have interest networks. So we have an animal-assisted interest network and all of that. So if you want more information, um, you've got our emails. But I do want to make sure that we move on because we've got just a few minutes left before Q&A, and I want to make sure that we talk about um, ethical issues and things like that. So just making sure that, you know, we don't have a whole lot of time to, to delve into multicultural competence, but we do want to recognize that our clients are not the same, um, that they are diverse, and that we want to be sensitive to those needs. So you want to understand your own cultural background, as well as that of your, your the client that you're working with or the family that you're working with, and seek training um, if you, you know, feel challenged in working with those populations. Um, next slide. So legal and ethical considerations, you know, I just want to touch on some of those and, uh, and all of that because what we don't want is, and I think sometimes creative approaches can get a bad rap because people think that we're just arbitrarily assigning a, a technique. Um, is it that we, people think, oh, well, you just use a technique, you know, just randomly with a client, and that's that's not the case. So when in your informed consent, you definitely want to make sure that clients understand your theoretical approach first, um, that, you know, that you want to be grounded in a theory. We're not just going in and using props, or we're not just going in and bringing our dog to the office and calling that animal-assisted therapy. So we want, you know, to explain that to clients. Also, the types of information needed. We want them to understand the purpose 
um, uh, behind the activities that we're doing and that this is a, a type of, of therapy. And uh, Dr. Thelma Duffy and Shane, Dr. Shane Haverstro, Thelma is the founder of ACC, but they're actually uh, um, doing a lot of research around creativity and counseling as a theoretical model. So there's some good research out that's come, um, that they've put out with that. I think it's actually a chapter in Dave Capuzzi, one of Dave Capuzzi's books. Um, developmental and cultural sensitivity, we certainly want to be um, aware of the developmental, our client's developmental level, um, uh, and be sensitive to their, their culture as well. So we don't want to um, make any kind of assumptions and that type of thing, that we want to you know, make sure that we're um, you know, just being considerate of that, that we don't want to implement an activity that would not, you know, with a client that was maybe not at a cognitive level of development that could um, participate. And then also new specialty areas of practice. Um, this is a really important one that, you know, just because you have toys in your office doesn't make you a play therapist. It, just because you bring your dog to work doesn't mean you're doing animal assisted therapy. Um, just because you attend one workshop on psychodrama doesn't mean that you should be implementing it in practice. So that you, counselors need to be aware of you know, the training requirements or you know, that they're getting training and supervision and um, in, in new areas of specialty practice because we don't want to do harm to clients and that's the most important thing um, you know, in working with clients. The other thing I just wanted to say is, um, will you, next slide, Jordan, is there? Uh, yeah. Be careful not to assume what the client's therapeutic needs are. So what we don't want to do is get so caught up in, oh, I've got this great activity. I want I bought this new pretty tassel and I want to use it with this client. It's like that might not be what the client needs at this point. And we don't want to make assumptions. Um, we only want to implement creative techniques and strategies after a relationship has been developed and a thorough assessment has been conducted because there could be something else going on. And if you think back when we talked about that very first slide, um, you know, with, with mom looking so overwhelmed, it's like, we don't want to assume that little Johnny who comes in and the teachers say he has ADD and that we say, okay, so let's use this activity to teach, um, just stop and think before you act. Because if we just get our own agenda of techniques, we might miss the opportunity of, of recognizing that Little Johnny's got a lot going on in his family background. And when you think about that very first picture I showed, I imagine several of those children might present at school, they might look as though they have ADHD, but that might not really be what's going, going on with them. Okay, so I think this puts us at a place with, um, with questions. Does anyone have any questions? You can ask them, you could come off of um, mute or you can type them in the chat. There is a question from Angel in the chat that says, are there certain approaches that are counterintuitive for integration of certain techniques? Um, I mean, I think my response to that is always just knowing your client, knowing their cultural background, knowing what you know. Um, you know, per se, this group and this doesn't work with this group. Not necessarily. I think it's really just looking at each client as an, as an individual. Um, and recognizing what, what might work. The other thing is, I think, also recognizing that in the reason the therapeutic relationship is so important is that um, I might have this wonderful idea for a technique and it may bomb. I mean, the client may not gain insight and I think, oh, well, that didn't go as well as I thought, but we have a therapeutic relationship so it didn't create any kind of wedge between, between us. So I think it's, it's knowing that. I, I did something once with a client, um, a metaphor, and this is where, you know, this was new in my counseling practice, but um, she, was, she was always getting hurt in relationships because she struggled with setting boundaries. Um, and that, you know, she would tell her deepest, darkest secrets to somebody that she barely knew and then the person would violate her trust and she would be depressed, you know, for weeks and weeks and cry and she didn't understand. So we were talking about setting boundaries. And so I drew a picture of a house and I drew a sidewalk and a, a, a fence in front of the you know, the, the sidewalk. And so I said to her, I said, you know, if you, I said, suppose you just met a person. I said, well, what's the most, what's the most personal space in your house? And she said, the bedroom. And I said, okay. So if you met a person, would you let them into your bedroom? You don't know this person. She's like, oh, no, no, no. I wouldn't let them into my bedroom. And I said, okay. Um, so if you met a person, would you let them into your gate? 
you know, into your front yard? And she's like, yeah, I might do that. And I was like, would you let them on your porch? She's like, well, maybe. I said, would you let them in your living room? And she was like, well, I, I don't know. It would depend on who it was. And so we had this whole conversation about, in my mind, boundaries and that you should, you know, that you would gradually get to know someone before you let them into your living room and into your kitchen or into your bedroom. And I didn't mean that from a sexual standpoint. Um, so the next couple of weeks she came in and she said something about that she didn't have any, any food in her house and that she hadn't, um, that she was in need of some things, but she hadn't gotten her disability check. And I said, well, why haven't you gotten your check? And she said, because I haven't, I haven't checked the mail. I haven't gotten my mail. And I said, why haven't you gotten the mail? And she said, because when the mailman comes, I thought about what you said. And I was like, get off my porch. You're not getting on my porch. So she took it literally. I was like, oh, it was a metaphor. <laughs> no, I didn't mean don't let him on your porch, really. <laughs> but, you know, cognitively, she wasn't at that place. Um, you know, developmentally, she wasn't at that place of where understanding a metaphor was very difficult for her. So, I, you know, that's kind of a long answer to your question about just, you know, I think it's really just knowing your client, knowing their cultural background and what you think might work and what might not work. We have other questions? I know we've got to be safe. There's one other question. It says, um, do you have experience in drama therapy um, or theater therapy techniques and when would it be appropriate? Uh, I don't. Um, I know we have, we have several though at a, with ACC that are very much involved um, with that. So that, I don't know that I can, can speak to that. Um, and I think it depends on like there are some people out there that are psychodrama um, or you know, certified and that that's what they do almost exclusively. And I think there are others that maybe do it, you know, where they might say, oh, okay, I'll, I'm going to use this with a family and we're going to put on a skit of what this might look like, you know, so I think it, it, it depends, um, depends on that. I know that we're at the, we've got to be sensitive to time because of the uh, room situation. So we're at 12.56. Uh, so I think we're supposed to be um, finished. So I just want to thank you all so much for coming. Uh, Jan and Jordan, thank you for doing such a wonderful job. Uh, please reach out to us if you have any questions or, you know, want additional information in the future. Um, we would be glad to, to help you with that. And thank you for all your creative um, uh, responses. Thank you. Thank, thank you, guys. I want to remind you um, that to access your CEs, you have to go to the last page of the conference program. There you'll see the link to the evaluation. Um, we ask that you complete that for any presentation you attend by April 19th. And finally, we want to, in addition to thanking all of you, we want to thank our sponsor for this conference, Tavera, who assists with um, online field work and uh, coursework management. Thank, thank you so that. much, everyone. We appreciate all of your feedback. And thank you so much, Dr. Moore and Jen. I appreciate your help. Thank you. Y'all have a great day. Bye, guys. Bye.